Welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark, and I'm so excited that you decided to connect today. Right now, grab something to take notes with as we begin today's message. Welcome to the month of July. Who here had a good time on July 4th? Yeah, I actually have a report here that was released from Harvard University this morning on the 4th of July. It was about a church in a place called Middletown, New York, that had members that, who ate way too much food for an average human being. Um, they said at the end they don't want to say any names to protect the church's integrity, but it rhymes with Hamily Merch. Um, so if you know anyone that goes to a church that rhymes with Hamley merch, just go ahead, pray for them, let them know, get some steps in. Uh, for my Thursday, I was at war with all the food options that were in front of me. We had jerk chicken, mm. curry goat, the rice and peas, then I'm getting ready to leave at 10, no, it was probably like midnight, and my uncle comes over with a whole fish. I'm like, uncle, I can't. Let's go ahead. I said, so good. <laughs> Fighting for my life, eating all these calories. If you had way too much calories, I just want to pray that the calories are gone in Jesus' name when you walk back to the car. And when that doesn't work, we've got Gold's Gym, we've got Crunch Fitness, so go ahead and get that gym membership. All jokes aside, we are continuing our series today called A Summer's Journey, where we're looking at different journeys within the Bible, and not just looking at the journeys that are in the Bible, but also looking at this journey we're in called life, and seeing how we can apply the things that God spoke to us in his word to help us move forward in our lives. Today, as a quick note, today's sermon was written by two volunteers in our church so I'm going to borrow some of their stories and tell them, but I just want you to know that this is greatly written, and I'm very excited to preach it today. So one of the volunteers, she was talking about her time in growing a garden, and here's what she said. She said, years ago when she started her vegetable garden, she thought it would be as simple as planting the vegetables in the soil. She thought to herself, gardening is simple. How hard can it be? Has anyone here ever struggled over a garden? Halfway through the season, you're like, this stupid garden. Why did I even get all excited about it at the beginning of the year? She said after some time, she decided to do some research about why her garden was not getting the results it should be. She saw that the amount of work that she was putting in was not lining up with the amount of fruit that she was getting at the end of every year. She said year after year, she tried to plant and grow, but these garden would just freeze and not bear much fruit. After some years, she would get a few tomatoes here and there, but other years she would get absolutely nothing. She said she felt like she was in a constant battle. After she did some research to see what was going on, she realized that she was planting her tomato seedlings way too close together, and all of the plants that she was trying to help grow were competing with each other for sunlight, nutrients, and killing themselves off. She said that the moment that this truth clicked in her mind, that things instantly began to change. She said that the moment this truth clicked in her mind, that things began to change. The moment that the truth clicked in her mind, things in her life began to change. She dug up her seedlings, spread them out, replanted them, and voila, the tomatoes grew stronger and greener than they had ever been. The point of this story is that if she did not know what the truth was in her mind, she would never reap the harvest that she desired. Amen. If she did not understand what the truth was, she would never reap the harvest that she wanted. She truly believed in her heart that she was doing the right thing. She truly believed in her heart that she was doing right by her garden. But at the end of the day, she said she realized that she was destroying the garden that she was trying to grow. And many times in our lives, there might be an area that's not bearing fruit. 
There might be an area where we're trying to control it and think that we're doing the right things. We might even have the right heart in our actions. But the reality is we might not be bearing fruit in our lives because we have the wrong mindset. We might be thinking that we're doing something right, but our tomatoes are actually too close together. We're actually working against ourselves. And there might be many things that take up space in our minds. Maybe it was a bad experience from the past. Maybe it was an old habit. Maybe there's a trust issue that's going on in your mind today. And today I simply want to ask you this question before we dive into our sermon. Have you ever had a moment where you thought you were doing what was right, but you ended up being your own worst enemy? Have you ever had a moment in your life where you thought you were doing the right thing, but in hindsight you're like, oh my goodness, I'm planting my tomatoes way too close. I'm the reason that I'm not bearing fruit in my life right now. There's a man in the Bible who is the most influential author in the New Testament, and his name is the Apostle Paul, and he also goes by the name of Saul. And much like we saw in the story at the beginning with the tomatoes, he thought that he was helping to cultivate God's garden. He truly believed in the book of Acts chapter 9 that he was doing the work of God, but in hindsight, he was actually tearing down what God was trying to build. He thought he was tending to God's garden only to realize that he's going through it with a weed whacker. Paul was a very religious man, and because he was committed to his religious mindset, he was tearing down God's people, even though I'm sure in his heart he thought he was doing God's work. And the reality is that the wrong mindset can often work against what God is trying to do in your life. And today as we're talking about journeys, we are talking about the journey to a new mentality. The journey to a new mindset. Going from a mindset where we're working against ourselves and we're working against God to a mindset where we are aligning with him. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says this, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then, everybody say then. then. So after our minds are renewed, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good pleasing and perfect will. Let's go ahead and pray this morning. Father, we come to you today in Jesus' name. And Lord, I thank you that as we came into this room today, that you had something in store for us, that you are here with us on this journey to a new mindset. So Lord, I thank you that you would speak to our minds, that you would speak to our hearts, that our ears would be open to receive everything that you have in store for us today. We say to you, Lord, have your way in this service. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So like I said, Paul is the most famous and influential Christian author in the New Testament who wrote at least 13 of the books. And as we look into his origin story in the book of Acts chapter 9, you'd expect that if he's the man, if he's the most influential, that his his origin is going to be amazing, right? No. (laughs) Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. So he's speaking that these murderous words, the potential to kill the disciples of God. That doesn't sound too much like the most influential author in the New Testament. It says then that he went to the high priest, so think of like the pastor of pastor of pastors, all the way up. And he asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, so Christians, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So in other words, he's saying, I need you to sign my permission slip to do what? He's like, I'm going to go up, find those Christians, I'm grabbing them by their weaves, and I'm (laughs) dragging them all the way back to Jerusalem. So he's ready. He's like, any Christian, I said, just come on, taking you to jail. And it says in the story that he was very well able to do this. And there's a very famous Christian who goes by the name of Stephen. 
And Saul or Paul, whatever you want to call him, he's there and he approves of when he gets stoned or when he gets killed. This man, the Apostle Paul, he thinks he's doing God's work. But in reality, he's working against God and his people. In other words, in his mind, he says, I need you to sign this so that I can go and do the work of God. But he's trying to plant this garden and he's putting these tomato seeds too close together. He's trying to help God, but he's actually persecuting God's people. And we see this in our own lives today. Just imagine that you get a brand new rug. And you ordered this rug and it was on back order, so it took you three months to finally get this rug. You've painted the whole room to go with the rug. You set up all the furniture. You finish your brand new design. You and your spouse are so excited. Like, finally, we get the rug. So you put the rug down. You can't just put down the rug. You got four kids. <laughs> Them kids act up. <laughs> so you call a family meeting. Say, everyone, this is our fifth child. <laughs> this is my baby. This is our new rug. So I don't want to see the dog on the rug. I don't want to see shoes on the rug. Actually, don't even look at the rug. <laughs> don't even look at the rug. You walk around. So you go off to work. First day, perfect. Second day, perfect. Third day, a kid, the, the corner of their pinky toe touches the rug, and they go, oh, the rug is dirty. They say, oh, my gosh, I have to clean the rug. What does mom use when she wants to clean the house really good? Bleach. Kid goes, grabs the bleach, covers the rug, proud. <sighs> the smell of a clean rug. Mommy, mommy, I cleaned the rug. And you look down at your hand and a belt appears already. And you just, you just walk up, you say, look. And the child in their mind, they're so proud. I cleaned mommy's rug with bleach. And what are you going to do? Well, we're going from five kids back to four. <laughs> because I've got to bury one. <laughs> that is what the Apostle Paul is doing in persecuting God's church. Saying, God, I'm going to do your work. And God's like, my rug, my church, you are doing the exact opposite of what you ought to be doing. And when we operate with the wrong mindset and try to do the right things, this is often what happens in our lives. That we genuinely believe that we are helping, but we're actually making things worse. This is what Saul did. Somebody say improper mindset. Improper mindset. He's clearly lost. There's clearly no hope for this man. But then somebody named Jesus walks into his life. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 9, a little bit after we see what his origin was, that Jesus goes to him and he shows up in a blinding light. And Jesus confronts him and he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul says, who are you, Lord? And Jesus shows up and he speaks to Saul and he actually ends up blinded from this experience. And now the, the process begins where God is transferring him from this mindset that he had, and God is transferring him into a new mindset. He's going on this journey into a new mind. The Bible says in verse 10 that in Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. So Saul is blinded. He, he's going to this house. He's stuck there. And then it says that, all right, here's the plan to get Saul into this new mindset. It says that there's a disciple named Ananias, and the Lord calls out to Ananias in a vision. And he says, yes, Lord, he answered. Verse 11, it says that the Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. So this journey to a new mindset is underwear, underway. And get, yes, Lord. Change a little bit. We're going to go ahead and just put it into reverse. 
So the journey to a new mindset is underway. <laughs> and God says, I'm going to use this man named Ananias to help set Paul free. Ananias is a Christian. So obviously he's like, Lord, thank you for this opportunity to pray over this man and see him set free, right? That's what we would say, right? Verse 13, Lord, so he knows he's talking to God. Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. So, Lord, I know where you think he's going, but let me tell you about his past. God, I know that you died and rose from the grave for me, but did you consider this man's past before you told me to pray for him? And I wonder if Jesus is in heaven like, you know what? I, I did not real Ananias, thank you. The plan I had from before the foundation of the earth, let me adjust it real quick. <laughs> Father and Holy Spirit, Ananias just informed me that Saul has a past. <laughs> Like, this is what's happening in this story, that God is going to set a man free, but the Christian in the story who's supposed to know the right thing to do is saying, but what about their past? And many times the journey to the new mindset is not just for the unbeliever, but as believers, sometimes our mindset needs to change as well. Because Jesus shows up and says, I'm going to transform this man's life. And Ananias says, yeah, but what about what he did? What about the things that he's done? He says in verse, verse 14 that Saul, he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. God shows up trying to set Saul free, and Ananias can only see his past. As a church, I want to encourage us today that if somebody is being transformed by God, we don't need to remind them of their past. It is not our job to do the math to see who can and who can't be saved. Amen. We see in this story that there's a man who is working against God who needs a new mindset, but there's also a Christian who is working against God who needs a new mindset. And guess what? That's okay. We don't have to always get it right as Christians. But when God brings us, like, hey, just so you know, here's some things to work on, it is in our court to say, all right, am I going to align with God or stay stuck in my old ways? We see in verse 15 that the Lord says to Ananias, go, this man is my, everybody say my, my. Chosen, chosen instrument. If God chooses him, then Ananias can't go against that choice. Because Jesus chose him. Listen to what he chose him for. To proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. Jesus says, go. Saul is the perfect person for what I need done. And guess what? When a choice makes no sense to you, that sounds a lot like something God would do. That he will use the most unlikely of people to do the things that he needs done in the earth. The story goes on to say that Ananias, he submits to what God is saying. He goes to Saul. He lays hands on him. Saul receives his vision, the Holy Spirit, his baptism, and he regains his strength. And let's see what happens when a man who is as strict and as murderous as Saul has an authentic encounter with Jesus Christ and Christ's followers. It says in verse 19 that Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. How long was he there? For several? So he's there for a few days. Verse 20, at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the son of God. Somebody say God can do it. After a few days, so now think about it. Saul is a leader. He's a leader of leaders among the Jews. He has access to the high priest. And now he's going to the Jewish temple, and now he's preaching against what the Jews would be preaching. After a few days, 
All those who heard him were astonished, and they asked, Isn't this the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who called on the name of Jesus? And isn't the point of his journey here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Paul was going to create prisoners, and himself, he was freed from his chains. This is the power of what God can do. In verse 22, it says, Yet Saul grew more and more powerful, and he baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. So Saul or Paul, he has this encounter with Jesus Christ, and he realizes my tomatoes are too close together. He realizes he's the child that's putting bleach on the new rug. He realizes that he was zealous to do the things of God, but he was not bearing any fruit. And in one encounter with Jesus Christ and the followers of Jesus Christ, everything in his world begins to change. And I want us to understand today that we play a role in seeing the lives around us change. That our role as Christians is not just to attend church on Sundays, but it's to bring church with us Monday to Saturday. If I was a betting man, I would guess that everyone in this room is connected to someone who needs Jesus. That everyone in this room is connected to someone who needs the hope of the gospel message. And what better person to deliver that message than you? What better person to help God in changing the lives around you than you? I want to encourage us today, if we feel like we can't help out in this, this story, like we can't help out in the gospel message, we might have the wrong mindset. That we might have a mindset that it's just that God and the church is going to do everything and I sit back. No, you are the church. You are the hands and feet of God in the world today. And if we want to see the lives around us change and we want to be a part of what God is doing and we have the wrong mindset, the truth is in anything that a wrong mindset will never lead to the right results. A wrong mindset will never lead to the right results. We see that in the life of Saul, that the moment he aligns his mindset with God, it says that he grew more and more powerful. That he was doing more and more of what God had created him to do. In the same way that Carrie, in the beginning of this story that she wrote, had to realize that her tomatoes were too close together and then she began to bear fruit, that we might need a moment where we look in the mirror and say, in whatever area it is in my life, my tomatoes are too close together. Let me dig some things up, separate them, that I might begin to bear fruit in my life today. We see that the Apostle Paul, as scary as he was going around and persecuting the church, that he's now preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let me ask you this question. According to the Bible, can an authentic encounter with Jesus save us from an improper mindset? Can an improper mindset change after a proper encounter with God? Yes. The answer is yes. But I want to ask you, do you believe that for yourself today? Do you really believe that something that you might have struggled with for 40 years that an encounter with Christ and his word today, that you can leave this building different than when you walked in. Yes, that is called faith. That is called faith. And I believe within this scripture and within this story that God leaves us a few clues of how we can start this journey into a new mindset that we might be able to bear fruit. The first key when it comes to a proper mindset is one, we have to know our purpose. Know your purpose. 
Wait, what does me knowing my purpose have to do with a proper mindset? Everything. Everything. We see later on in this story that Paul, because he's preaching the gospel and he's going around to these synagogues, he's like a big troublemaker in the cities. It's like everywhere that he goes, he's preaching this message boldly and he's stirring up trouble because he's starting to make divisions. We're like, wait, the Jews are trying to go after Paul, but now people are trying to persecute them. He's going around saying, hey, you've got to change this and change this and change this because here's who God truly is. And he's on trial because of it before a king named Agrippa. And Paul, he's explaining his side to the story. He's explaining how he was on the Damascus road and how he fell in a light and how God came to him and Jesus spoke to him. And it says this. Then Paul, sharing his story, says, then I asked this man who came to me, who are you, Lord? Jesus says back to him, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. Imagine you're on your way to persecute Christians and then Jesus shows up to you and speaks directly into your life. This is what Paul is saying happened to him. Jesus says to him, I'm sending you to them to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they might receive the forgiveness of sins and place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. That's his purpose. Jesus is saying directly into Paul, here is why you are on the earth today. And the moment that Paul understands his purpose, his life and his mindset changes. He goes from trying to do the things of God in his own strength, pouring bleach all over God's rug, to aligning himself with exactly what God needs him to do. And the truth is, when you realize the weight of what God called you to do, you realize that you can never do it in your own strength. And that's the point. That is the point. God doesn't give us a call and gets like, here's a tiny thing that you can do on your own. You don't need me. No, it's like, here's what you are capable of doing in my name. And usually we say, there's no way I could do that. And God said, you can in your own strength. But through me, all things are possible. This is the nature of what Paul goes through. It is God who has a calling and a purpose for our life. And if you're struggling with thinking in the right mindset, and you feel like you're scrambled, I want to encourage you, start with him. If you're looking for your purpose, like Pastor Mike said last week, start with your creator. There's one theme that we see all throughout the scriptures, that God uses many people for mighty things, but they lay their lives before him. It is in that position of God, what do you have for me, that they walk right into their purpose. The way up into your purpose is by starting down at the feet of Jesus. The second part, the second point that helps us with this journey to a new mindset is to change the filter in your mind. Change the filter in your mind. By a show of hands, who in this room loves coffee? Like everyone at your job can tell whether or not you had time to stop at Dunkin' Donuts. They say, oh, she ain't get her coffee. Give her till 10. Let the caffeine in the office kick in. Have you ever went to make a cup of coffee and you're excited for it? You get your creamer ready, you get your sugar, you brew the pot, you stir it, you go, you sit down on the couch. You sip your coffee. Mmm. And there's just chunks of grounds floating in it. You just got to chew it like, mmm. We got a burst of flavor in this coffee. That's nasty, right? You know why there's grounds in your coffee? Because the filter didn't do its job. The filter did not do its job. The point of a coffee filter is to keep the grounds and let the coffee pass through. The point of an oil filter on your car is to filter out any contaminants and let the good stuff pass through. 
A filter keeps out the wrong things and lets the right things through. But if your mind has a bad filter, guess what? Sometimes you're going to filter out the right things and let through the wrong things. And many times in our lives, the tomatoes that are too close together, it's not because the world around us is a problem. It's because the filter in our mind. We understand that a good, good filter will always remove the harmful things and allow the right things through. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. The Apostle Paul, yes, the same Paul from our story that was persecuting the church, he's now writing a letter to the church at Rome. Like this is massive. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, or some translations say his compassion or love for us, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. So he builds a bit of an argument here. He says the first part of this argument is to offer your bodies, or offer really what he's saying, all of who you are as a sacrifice. You know what a sacrifice is? Giving up something that you value for something that you value even more. So if you're connected to someone and they ask you to do something and you really don't want to do it and you do it, you're essentially making a sacrifice. Because I value what I want to do, but I value you more than I value what I want to do. So I'm making a sacrifice to you. So he says, offer to God yourself as a living sacrifice. Give up you because you value God more. Holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. He then says, do not conform. So after you offer yourself to God, do not conform or live in alignment with the pattern of this world, but be transformed. Everybody say transformed. By the renewing of your your mind. So get your heart in alignment with God. Offer yourself as a sacrifice to him. And then from that position of the right heart posture, now align your mindset with the posture of your heart. Don't live in alignment with the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It is then that you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. In other words, when you give your heart over to God, align your mind with God, and then you look at the garden of your life, you're going to see all the tomatoes that are planted too close together. And you're going to have the eyes to see what God's will is. Paul did not have the eyes to see that he was persecuting Jesus until he was aligned with him. And in our own lives, when we align ourselves with God and we take on his eyes and we see his purpose, everything that we used to do and used to say and used to be is going to look completely different. Because now we are able to test God's will and see, wait, this thing that I've accepted, this is not God's will for my life. So I'm not just going to live here anymore. I'm going to go on this journey to a new mind and walk with God. We see that Paul is writing this letter to this church, and we see that his heart is aligned, his mind is aligned, and now he understands what God's will is. The hard part about this is we say, God, I need you to fix my mind, and then I'll give you my heart. Because that's the easy way. But God says, no, give me your heart and watch your mind transform. He says, trust me, and then we'll be transformed. The reality is the mindsets that we have are a direct extension of where our heart is. The way that we think is often an extension of our heart. You ever have tried to have a conversation with someone who might be like struggling with unforgiveness, and you're like, yeah, I know what they did to you back then, but like they're a different person now. Look what they did, and they're like, no, you don't know them. And you say, no, no, seriously, like, look, the things that you say you hate about them, they're completely new. And you say, no, no, it's not a mind problem. Your mind clearly can understand that this person has changed. But your heart says, the thing that they did to me, I'm not going to forgive them. And that's the nature of how our minds are simply an extension of what we believe in our hearts. 
So essentially, if we get our hearts in alignment with God, guess what's going to happen to our mind? It's going to shift to his perspective. The third point today is simply get dressed. Yes, underwear and all. <laughs> underwear and all. Get dressed. Ephesians 4.22, you are taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, what is being, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. So the old self, the Bible, when it says corrupted, it's literally, it's wasting away. The person that you used to be is wasting away by its deceitful desires. Do you know the old you still has desires? And those desires are deceitful. They trick you into what? Wasting away. But watch what he says in contrast to that. He says, put off the old self which is corrupted by deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. He says the old you is corrupted and wasting away. So put on the new you. And what does he talk about? The attitude of your what? Of your mind. And he says that person is created for righteousness and holiness. For whose sake, this is Paul writing again, I have lost all things. He says I consider all those former things. He was very, very powerful and high up in the religious sects. He says, I consider them garbage that I might gain Christ. All the things of his religious sex that he was living in, those are garbage that I might gain Christ. Here he encourages them, put off the old self which is being wasted away in corruption and put on the new you. The reality is none of us are going to be God but we can certainly look more and more like him on this journey. Have you ever met someone and the way that they smile or they shake your hand is like the love of God? Yeah. I forgot your name again. I told my brother over here, what's your name? Steve. Every Sunday I go and I talk to Steve. Steve's smile is like next level. <laughs> it's like I feel like every week when I talk to Steve, like Jesus is right there smiling. It's so genuine. So it's like every Sunday, it's like, I know I'm here to like work at the church. I'm like, I'm going to I'm I'm, I'm get a little dose of Steve. <laughs> every single week, Steve, don't miss church now. <laughs> now you're stuck. It's like for me to talk to Steve and shake Steve's hand and look into his eyes is a lot like looking at God. And when we have those moments where we're in alignment with God, guess what? The people at your job can come into contact with God and not even realize it. The way that you love, show compassion, show grace, it's almost as if they're coming into contact with God. Now, are we the source of it? No. But we're like a mirror, like God shines his love and we could bounce it to the world around us. As we go on this journey to a new mind in this life with God, we understand that he plants the perfect seed of his grace. That within his grace is everything that we need for this Christian journey. But how, how many of you who garden know that sometimes there are weeds that need to be pulled? That sometimes there's stuff in us in our garden that need to go. And I simply want to ask as we're closing out today, what weeds have you allowed to grow and take root in your mind? What mindsets do you have that might be working against you? Like we saw in the opening story, that one tiny change in your mindset can lead to huge results. That one little understanding that my seeds are too close together in my garden can lead to massive change. It might be time to have a new mindset and to pull some weeds. We might have some ideas that are working against us and I am so glad that by God's grace and by the power of his Holy Spirit that we have the power to see those things transformed. Yes. There may be some gardens in the weed of our minds that we are responsible for removing. There might be weeds of, I just have to do this on my own because I've messed up. 
There might be weeds of, I don't deserve God, so I'm not even going to try to change. There might be weeds of, I did this to myself, so I'm not going to reach out to God. And I want to encourage you that Jesus Christ has set you free from those things. That Jesus Christ has set you free from those struggles. The Bible says that whom the Son has set free is free indeed. So today as we close out, I want to take a, a moment to pray. Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes. And if you're here today and you're saying, Pastor Josh, I really struggle with my mind. I really struggle with my mindset. My tomatoes are too close together. The filter in my mind is not working properly and I need help. I want to encourage you today that if that's you, I want you to wave at me real quick. In an act of faith, wave at me and say, I need some help. I see all of you. Let's pray this morning. Father, I come to you today. In Jesus' name. And I thank you, Lord, that in this moment, that all of us in this room, that we have the strength and the power by your spirit to take every thought captive and make it subject to you. I thank you, Lord, that the lies are replaced by the truth of your word. God, I thank you that in this moment that hatred is being exchanged for love. That unforgiveness is being exchanged for grace. That a lack is being exchanged for an abundance. That hopelessness is being exchanged for joy. I thank you, Lord, for every person in this room, no matter what the struggle might be, that you're giving us a sense of clarity. That just as you appeared to Saul on the road to Damascus, Lord, may you appear in our hearts right now. And help our minds to be transformed. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to pray a second prayer today. For anyone who says, I have not yet given my life to Jesus. Maybe you feel like you're Saul on this Damascus road and you have been contrary to the things of God. And today you want to say, I want to give my life over to him. We all pray this prayer together. Repeat after me. Say, dear God, I come to you today just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I believe that you died and rose for me. Come into my heart. Come into my life to change me and make me new. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. My name is Pastor John Mark, and I'm so glad we were able to connect together today. If this impacted you in any way, I need you to do a few things for me. I need you to like and subscribe to this channel and head over to FamilyChurchNY.com to take your next steps.